Okay, here's that slide from part now, uh, 9. Now we're up to part 10. And notice that these radicals are in the same order <clears throat> as the carbocations were. In fact, I just put the big dot to represent the unpaired electron on top of what used to be a plus sign. So that's why these dots look a little strange here. Uh, because for tertiary radicals, they are the most stable, just like the tertiary carbocations. Methyl radicals are least stable, just like the corresponding carbocation would be. And so if we have an alkane that has a mixture of carbons that are tertiary or secondary, primary, then that's going to lead to different products. And we're going to find that there's a favoritism for doing the substitution on radicals that are second, uh, tertiary versus these others. And so here's the general rule. Just like carbocations, we have the same order of uh, stability, which means the tertiary ones form faster. And so depending on the type of alkane we're using, we may only get one possible product when we chlorinate it or brominate it, uh, but we can also sometimes get mixtures. Uh, in these first two examples, we only get one possible chlorination product, assuming that we're only adding one chlorine at a time, because for ethane here, all six of those hydrogens are equivalent. doesn't matter which one I substitute, I'm going to get chloroethane. I'm obviously showing one of the hydrogens off the first carbon on the left being substituted, but uh, there's only one chloroethane. Likewise, cyclopentane here, it has 12 hydrogens, all of which are equivalent, and so if I do a substitution of one of those hydrogens, I get chlorocyclopentane. And that H nu, by the way, refers to a photon of ultraviolet light because that kind of light gets us started because it breaks those two chlorines into radicals and gets the ball rolling. Butane is an interesting case because I don't get just one particular chlorobutane. I could imagine I could get either the one chlorobutane, the one on the left here, or two chlorobutane. Those are the two isomers of chlorobutane. And these percentages are what are found to be true when this reaction is actually carried out. We get a lot more of the two chloro product. And that's a little surprising because if we look at the number of hydrogens that are available to be removed, that would give us the one chloro product. There's six of them because I could get one chlorobutane if I removed any of these three hydrogens on the left or any of those three on the other end. So I've got six hydrogens, any one of which can be removed to give me this first product. Notice there's four hydrogens, any one of which could be removed to give me the two chloro product. So I might guess that I would get more of the one chloro simply because there's more hydrogens available uh, to lead to that product. This next slide shows what I mean. If all hi these hydrogens were equally reactive, if they all could be removed at equal rates, then we would expect to get 10% reaction at all 10 locations. And again, that would only lead to two possible products because these three hydrogens on the left and these three down here on the other end, uh, all of those would lead to one chlorobutane. So that's six chances out of 10 to get one chlorobutane, or 60%. We might expect to only get 40% of the 2-chloro product because there's only 4 hydrogens out of the 10 that, that could be substituted to give us that. So we say these are the statistical probabilities just looking at the structure of butane. But yet we get a very different ratio and in fact we get a lot more of the 2-chloro product. And that has to do with the stability of the radicals that are formed along the way.